Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Could we look at poll 00323665? It's the same email as we were looking at just before the break, but this one um, just has a little more information on screen. Um, do you recall we were looking at this document, and um, I think you were suggesting that it was Mr. Bradshaw rather than yourself who was effectively pushing not to carry out more investigations. Is that correct? Uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting he, he, he was pushing not to. No. No? And what are you suggesting? Sorry, what reason? Well, let's, let's have a look. So we're Wednesday, 12th of December, 12, uh, 2 12 p.m. Um, we then have a document that you mentioned just before the lunch. It's FUJ 00153884. Yes. I think this is the email that you were referring to. It's an email from yourself to Gareth Jenkins. Yes. Um, not very long after, 3.29, so an hour later. Yes. Saying, dear Gareth, the investigator is happy with the report as it stands. Please can you proceed as before? Many thanks. Uh, now, I, I think you said that the investigator was said in an ironic sense. Yes. Uh, how are we to read that email? Uh, I'm displeased uh, with him um, because he hasn't carried out his investigations. And how are you showing in that email that you were displeased with Mr. Bradshaw? Uh, I'm instead of just saying Paula happy, uh, I'm using the word investigator specifically. I think because I'm not happy with the way that he's carried out that role. Do you think that a reasonable person reading that email would infer that you no. were displeased with the investigator? No. So is it just something that you yourself would have known? Yes. I mean, isn't it entirely consistent with the suggestion that you made to the investigator in the previous email? Also, yes. Um, can we look, please, at poll 00089374? I think this is another doc email that you were referring to before the break, uh, and it's an email from Jarnail Singh about cost. Um, so he says in an email to Rachel Panter, um, the cost of obtaining data statements is very expensive, which simply results from post office contractual <laughs> obligations to Fujitsu and also legal compliance and budgetary obligations uh, puts further restraint on obtaining such data from Fujitsu. Therefore, it's very important due process is strictly followed. Uh, I need to be notified if anything is required from Fujitsu. I think that's the email you were referring to it is. before. Um, was there anything, I mean, this is in November, so this isn't in the particular context of that particular discussion that you were having with Gareth Jenkins. Is there anything over and above that that... Uh, led you to believe that the post office didn't want to obtain the data? Uh, no, it was simply uh, Mr. Bradshaw's um, inactivity in getting it. Um, one of the things that Mr. Jenkins said that you could obtain is the data itself, he said, was free, but it's his time analysing it that costs money. Yes. Did you consider obtaining the data itself? Uh, I I think I did, um, and I think I thought that uh, without his analysis, uh, it wouldn't be worth much. Um, what about to the defendant? Might it be worth something to the defendant to have the raw data? Yes, absolutely, I agree with you. Um, do you think that that was uh, another mistake? Yes. Can we please look at FUJ 00124200? And this is the statement from Mr. Jenkins in the Allen case. Uh, 
Paragraph one, again, same as, as the previous statement we looked at. And it's over the page, please, that we get to the specific part about Mr. Allen's case. He says, I've been asked to provide a statement in the case of Grant Allen. So similar form of words to the previous case, just now reflecting the specifics of this case study. I understand that the integrity of the system has been questioned, and this report provides some general information regarding the integrity of Horizon. I note that in the summary of facts, it is stated that during the period of relocation in March 2010, that Mr. Allen believed that a £3,000 discrepancy was due to Horizon not sending out data, non-polling. I've been shown extracts from the Horizon non-polled reports for the period um, in March, which shows that the Winsford branch was included in this report for 12 days, up to and including the 17th of March. This in itself is unusual, as if a branch appears to be non-polled uh, report for more than a few days, an attempt is made to retrieve the data by other means before day 10. In brackets, I have no knowledge as to whether this occurred in this case or not. Just pausing there, um, is that something that an inquiry could have been made into. Sorry, repeat that. Where he says, I have no knowledge as to whether this incurred, occurred in this case or not. He may have no knowledge, uh, but do you think that an investigator could have been tasked or he could have been tasked to make further inquiries within Fujitsu as to um, whether any attempts were made to retrieve data? This is himself. Yes, it could have been, yes. Um, this in itself is unusual. Um, again, do you see this uh, as expert evidence or speaking from his own personal knowledge uh, of his own company's processes? It's probably both, is it? Um, and then he says, this confirms the fact that there were indeed communications issues between Horizon and the data center at this time. However, it should have no impact on data recorded locally within the branch, provided all operational processes were followed correctly. That's, oh. the, that's the caveat, isn't it? A absolutely. So had he looked at the data, he may have been in a better position to say one way or another. Do you, would you agree with that? Yes. Um, also, once communications were restored, all historical data, again, should have been sent from the branch back to the data center as normal. So do you agree that if, if a thorough investigation had taken place into um, the actual underlying data, that there may have been more clarity in that regard? Yes. Um, he says, I have not had an opportunity to examine the detailed logs from this period to see whether there were any issues and any justification in the claim that this resulted in apparent system losses of £3,000 as claimed. Um, now, not had an opportunity to examine. Do you think that that is a fair and accurate description of the correspondence that we've been going through before lunch? Well, it's suggesting that he was told not to uh, do that, which is correct, but equally... Um, he would have had access to the data working within Fujitsu, so he could have chosen to do that himself. And I believe, in fact, Fujitsu went on, or his managers went on, to task him with that. Um, the correspondence that we saw between yourself and Mr Jenkins, and also the correspondence with Mr Bradshaw, um, do you think that Mr Jenkins had an opportunity to examine the logs, but was told not to? or was told that it wasn't necessary? Well, he, he was told it wasn't required at that time, yes. If we go to the penultimate page, um, we have the words, same as the previous statement on horizon integrity. Scrolling over the page, we have the final paragraph that says, in summary, I would conclude by saying that I fully believe that Horizon will accurately record all the data that is submitted to it, 
um, and correctly account for it. However, it cannot compensate for any data that is incorrectly input into it as a result of human error, lack of training, or fraud. Um, so I fully believe that Horizon will accurately record all data. Um, in circumstances where there was an opportunity to actually look at the actual data in this case, um, do you think it is fair that a statement was submitted in this case um, with a belief that Horizon will accurately record all of the data? Well, he's saying that he believes he will do. He's not saying that it did. Um, and he's making it clear that the data is there and available for consideration. But as the solicitor with conduct of the case, do you think that it was fair to submit a statement that had a belief in the accuracy uh, without a proper assessment of what actually happened in the particular facts of this case? Yeah, I accept what you're saying. Um, both of those cases, case studies that we've been looking at, the Sefton and Allen cases, were being considered by you in 2012. Um, and we've looked at documents up until December 2012. Um, as at this period, late 2012 going into 2013, um, what was your view as to the number of Horizon challenges? It, that Cartwright King were dealing with, yes. I mean. Uh, it, it's, as far as I understood, this, the same ones in the list you'd previously flagged up with the names. Um, what did you think about the rising challenge to the Horizon system at that time, late 2012 into 2013? Well, clearly there was, there was a, uh, widespread concerns about it. Um, and were you concerned about it? Yes. Can we please look at poll 00108074? This is advice in a case um, of Fazana Akta. And if we look at the final page, page five, this is an advice that was written by you 31st of August 2013. If we go to the page before, Horizon Issues. The case is based on data provided by the Horizon system. Given the defendant's denial of any wrongdoing, the inference that could be drawn is that she and the complainants are both telling the truth that the system is at fault. Uh, one would therefore expect the defence to jump on the Horizon bandwagon. If you were concerned about the Horizon system as at 2012-2013, um, why in advice were you writing about defendants jumping on the horizon bandwagon. It's the repeated use of that word that I'd come across, um, and I've just uh, adopted that same phraseology. Uh, I mean, by that stage, you were aware of the Second Sight report, for example. Yes. Why do you think that you were referring to the horizon bandwagon rather than referring to genuinely believed cases? As I say, I was subjected to hearing that word used repeatedly, and I've adopted it myself. Subjected? Oops, subjected is not quite right, but I had been hearing it repeatedly. Who from? People around me, people in poll, investigators. Um, can we look at poll 00108114? Another advice, this case, uh, Tirath Chalal. Can we look at page eight? We're now September, so a month later, September 2013. Page 12, please. Sorry, page seven, paragraph 12. Uh, again, we see there, it's likely that this defendant will grasp at any potential defense available to him and must therefore, an attempt to jump on the horizon bank wagon must be anticipated. So this was just a phrase that was routinely used at Cartwright King at the post office and which you adopted as your own. Yes. 
I'm going to move on to a slightly separate topic and very briefly. Could we look at poll 00038538? Um, there came a time in 2013 where you were involved in a review of um, previous cases involving Horizon, is that correct? Correct. Um, this is the general review advice written by Brian Altman. Um, w did you have any interaction with Mr. Altman at all? Uh, no, I didn't, no. Um, can we look at page 27? Um, top of page 27, he says, during a telephone call um, in which representatives from post office, Bond Dickinson and Cartwright King and himself participated, it was agreed um, a, a particular start date was proportionate. Uh, and then further down the page, 20, uh, 75, he said, the question that's been posed is, had, poll, had the post office been possessed of the material contained within the second site interim report during the currency of any particular prosecution, should or would we have been required to disclose some or all of that material to the defence? Um, this was an exercise, I think, that you took part in. Is that correct? Yes, the review, uh, an initial sift uh, of all those prosecutions, yes. If we look at page 32, paragraph 94, of Mr. Altman's advice. Can you just briefly tell us, what, what did that sift involve? Um, it was taking all the, all the files that had been prosecuted uh, were transported to the office in Derby, where I was relocated, and uh, we were given a question which had been posed by Mr. Clark uh, to capture any cases where Horizon might have been an issue. I think it was a phrase he used, so a very wide uh, definition to, tr to ensure that um, all of those cases were considered subsequently. Um, and Mr. Altman notes here that at the conference he did make the observation um, that lawyers should not be engaged in sifting or reviewing a case if they were responsible for conducting the case at trial. Um, and I think he, sorry, at, at the paragraph above, 93, he says that he had been told that yourself and Martin Smith had been involved in sifting some of your own cases. That, that, that's right. Um, the Sefton and Neil uh, file was one that I was obviously aware of and put that on Mr. Clark's desk for him to consider. Um, Are you able to assist us with whether there was any change to the processes after Mr. Altman's advice in terms of how the SIFT was carried out? I can't recall. Did you continue to review cases that you had been involved in? I'm not sure. Most of them were not related to me. Uh, did you review cases that close colleagues had been involved in? The vast majority of them were from pre-Cartwright King involvement. Uh, and what proportion of them would you say were Cartwright King cases? Less than 5%. Uh, and were they the kinds of cases that we've been looking at today? Uh, Prosecuted by Mr. Bowyer or s somebody yes, like that? Yes. One other document from slightly later, 2014 now. Can we look at poll 00032368.1? We're now in March 2014, and this is an email from yourself to Roderick Williams. Um, subject Horizon Expert Instruction and you say, uh, Martin's at a funeral, he's asked me to forward these documents. Also, I spoke to a consultant about 15 minutes ago who rang to run a position statement by us for the board on Monday relating to not commenting on turning points in criminal cases that have gone to trial. I'm waiting to speak to Simon on the subject, but have yet to receive an email from the consultant with her details to respond. Are you able to assist us with your recollection about that issue? No, I'm afraid I can't. I can't remember who the consultant was or what happened consequently. 
Uh, do you recall the post office liaising with yourself or your colleagues about public responses to issues relating to Horizon? So I've picked up this call because Martin Smith is not available. Normally he, he would be the first point of contact and take all these kind of calls. Apart from this particular instance, do you recall any conversations or discussion of any conversations where the post office was um, running position statements by your firm? No. Um, the two documents that are attached, I very briefly will just have a quick look at those. Can we look at poll 00323682? You'll see there are two attachments. One's draft scope for computer experts, and the second is Horizon Core Audit Process Executive Summary. Um, this is the draft scope for computer experts. I, I'm not going to go through it in any detail, but can you assist us? Is this a document that you are aware of the purpose? I was aware that um, Mr. Clark and Martin Smith were engaged in trying to source a new expert um, and it looks like this document was for their purposes. Thank you. If we could scroll through that document, we can see the draft scope. So th this was an expert to replace Gareth Jenkins after Mr. Clark had given his advice on the use of Mr. That, Jenkins. That's right. I believe they went on a number of meetings uh, to uh, a number of computer departments at universities to try and source one. Uh, and were you involved in that process at all? No. no. Um, and the next document is poll 00323683. This was also attached to that email. And this is a document entitled Horizon Core Audit Process from December 2013. And if we scroll over the page, it has an executive summary there that refers to um, what we know as remote access, I think. It says, when a transaction is conducted at a counter, an auditable mechanism has been built in to ensure that these transactions are taken from the counter, stored in the Horizon main branch database, and then copied to an audit database. Uh, the mechanism can be considered a closed loop where information is securely exchanged from the counter to the Horizon branch database and then on to the auditable audit database. Um, when copies of transaction data are provided to numerous external systems from the main Horizon database, the core audit process is segregated, its records are securely sealed, and audit records cannot be accessed or changed through external interfaces. Um, is the issue of remote access something that you had to deal with at all? No. Is this a document that you recall having any involvement in other than forwarding? No. no. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to pass on to Ms. Dobbin in, in a moment. Is there anything else that you um, would like to address at all or would like to say to the Chair? Uh, simply to reiterate the apology I'd made in my written statement. Thank you. Uh, sir, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Um, thank you. I think Ms. Dobbin has some questions. Is it just Ms. Dobbin, just so that I know what's happening? It is, yes. Yeah, fine. Thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bills, my name is Claire Dobbin and I represent Gareth Jenkins. I want to ask you some questions about the provenance of his generic witness statement and I'm going to take you to some documents to do that. Yes. But if at any stage I go too fast, will you please let me know in okay. case the documents you're not familiar with. I wanted to start though, if I can, at the beginning with the document POL 00141416. You've seen this already, Mr. Bolts. It's the questions that Mr. Bowyer framed for the experts' report. Yes? Yes. And you did look at those earlier. I wonder if we could just please highlight those questions. Thank you. I just wanted to focus on them, if we may, a little more. Mr. Bolts. 
So we can see that what the expert was to address was a description of the system in layman's terms, yes? Yes. A declaration that it had yet to be attacked successfully? Yes. A summary of the basic attacks made on the system, concentrating on any expert reports served in past cases, yes? Yes. I won't go through all of it, but then plainly, the last we see at four, the question asking about human error, correct? In other words, could, could discrepancies be caused by human error, correct? Yes. And as I understand your evidence, Mr. Bulls, you haven't seen these questions. Is that correct? Correct. Do you agree that those questions are narrow in their compass? Repeat that, sorry. Do you agree that the questions are narrow in their compass? Oh, oh narrow. Um, yes. And I think you said earlier that you agreed that they were focused on litigation rather than on the system itself, correct? Yes. So in other words, that the expert wasn't going to be asked to give an account of previous errors or issues that had affected the Horizon system, yes? Um, I'm not sure if it goes that far. Well, let's look at it again. It certainly mm. doesn't go that far. Three, a summary of the basic attacks made on the system, concentrating on any expert reports served on past cases. Yes. The focus is on issues that have been raised in litigation, isn't it? Yes. And then the fourth question, the question about whether or not human error could account for discrepancies. Yes? The question is? Well, again, it's quite a narrow question, isn't it? Yes, I understand what you're saying, yes. So you agree with me, Mr. Bolts, that these questions were not intended to elicit an expert report that, for example, set out the history of, for example, past issues or errors that had arisen in the Horizon system. Isn't that covered in question number three, a summary of the basic attacks made on the system? But as we can see, concentrating on any expert reports served in past cases. Yes? Yes. Were you aware, and I think it, the answer to this must be that you weren't, that the statement you ultimately served in the cases of Miss Sefton and Miss Neild, and in the case of Mr. Allen, that that statement was responsive to those four questions? You're correct, I wasn't aware. Had you been aware of that, do you think you would have viewed that statement in a different light? Quite possibly, yes. Because again, you would have understood that the statement was narrower in its compass than you understood, yes? Well, I would have understood it was in relation to these specific questions, yes. It's right, Mr. Bolson, you would know this, wouldn't you? That the instructions that an expert has been given are part of the necessary inclusions on an expert report or statement, yes? Yes, that, that is correct, yes. So in other words, that these questions ought to have formed part of the statements that you served in those cases, correct? They should have done, yes. But you didn't know about them? That's correct. And again, had that happened, then anyone who was reading that statement would have understood that in fact it was responsive to four quite narrow questions. Correct? Indeed they would. And do you also agree, Mr. Bulls, that this sort of background is part of the material that ought to have been recorded on a disclosure schedule? 
in other words, that this formed part of the background of the statements that you went on to serve? That's correct. But again, it didn't go on a disclosure schedule because you didn't know anything about these communications. That's Is correct. That right? And I think, again, it follows from your evidence, Mr. Bulls, that you didn't know that these four questions had resulted in a report being prepared by Mr. Jenkins. Is that correct? That's correct. I just want to show you the first page of the report, um, just to ensure that you're not familiar with it. And if I may, that is document FUJ 00123914. Is that a document that you've seen before? Is it one of the two attachments to the... It's not, Mr. Bolts. Oh. So perhaps if we could just scan through that document quickly. If it's not one of the two that would have been attached to his other statement, then uh, I'm not sure I would have seen it now. Right. That report becomes Mr. Jenkins' generic witness statement, Mr. Bulls, and it was edited or cut and pasted in a w into a witness statement. I think you've said you weren't involved in that process. I Is was that not. right? That's correct. So, for example, you wouldn't have known that this report set out that Mr. Jenkins didn't know anything about 21 of the cases that Helen Rose had dealt with in her report. Sorry, repeat the question. You wouldn't have known, for example, then, that Mr. Jenkins had set out in this report that he didn't know anything about 21 of the cases that Helen Rose dealt with in her report? No. All right. And do you agree, Mr. Bulls, that the fact that this sort of report existed and became a statement was also relevant to your disclosure duties? Yes. And that follows because a draft report, or an, it's not a draft report, a report like this that serves as a foundation for another report or a witness statement ought to be listed on a schedule of unused material. Do you agree? Yes, akin to an investigator's notebook or something like that. But again, that didn't happen because you didn't know anything about this report. Correct. In terms of your interactions with Mr. Singh and his involvement in commissioning this witness statement from Mr. Jenkins, did he ever discuss with you what had happened in the Misra case? No. Did he tell you that in the Misra case, in fact, there had been evidence about the calendar square bug? No. Did he tell you that in Misra, Fujitsu had explained that there was a locking issue that caused transactions to be lost? No. Did he explain to you that in Misra, um, Fujitsu had explained that there was a record of around 200,000 faults, both in the testing and live system on Horizon. No. Was that something he explained? Did he explain anything to you about an error log? No. Did he tell you that, in fact, the approach in the Misra case had been that Mr. Jenkins had been asked to examine the data for about a year for that post office in order to ascertain whether or not there were any issues with Horizon at that branch? No.
and he didn't ever suggest to you that it might be worth commissioning a broader report into Horizon to canvas those sorts of issues? No. Just, if I may, going back to how the report changed, um, my learned friend, Mr. Blake, took you to the line that appeared in the statement which set out my duty as to the court. Do you remember that line in the generic witness statement? A very brief sentence, yes. And did you have anything to do with the insertion of that line into the draft witness statement? No. You didn't explain to Mr Jenkins, for example, the sorts of duties that an expert was subject to and what duties to the court encompassed? No. And were those things that you anticipated or thought had been explained to him by Mr Singh? Yes. We know that that report ultimately became the generic statement and we've seen the email discussion with Miss Panter where she mentioned that she had found it. Do you remember? Yes. I'm not going to go back to it because I, it doesn't I, I matter. Believe, yes, I do. In terms of Miss Panter, can I just check with you, please? She's been referred to by one witness as a paralegal. Can you assist as to whether or not she was, in fact, a solicitor at your firm? I can't. She may have been a paralegal. I can't recall. She was certainly very junior, wasn't she? Yes, she was. I think we've seen some reference to her just having been out of bar school, possibly. Does that accord with your recollection of how junior she was? It's possible, yes. I want to pick up then, if I may, in the chronology. And if I could go to a document, POL 009761. Please may we go to the entry for the 19th of October, page 3. So can you see Mr Jenkins is saying, sorry, but I'm unaware of this case. Yes, I see it. And if we just scroll up. And if we just scroll up, please, a little bit more. It's the bottom of page one. Thank you. I think we can see from the bottom of this page this is in relation to the original generic statement <coughs> that Mr Jenkins hadn't understood that it related to a specific case, that he thought that it was just a general statement. So, sorry, where are you? I'm so sorry. So if we're looking at the 19th of October, it's been highlighted and drawn out. It's from Mr Jenkins. To Sharon Jennings? Yes. This is in relation to the generic statement, the original generic statement. Sorry, your question. You're looking a little puzzled. I am sorry, I've lost the thread. <laughs> All right. We can see from the earlier emails that Miss Panter referred to a statement that she had found, a generic statement, yes? I understand, yeah. And I had just wanted to pick up the chain here to see if you're familiar with this that Mr Jenkins hadn't understood that that report or statement was for any specific case. Was that something that you were aware of or understood? No. So what was your understanding? Oh, sorry. I'm <laughs> of the status of the generic report, Mr Bolts. Did you understand that it had just been prepared or provided 
for a case or for any specific reason. So I'm not sure what, what, it, what it's been provided for. The original generic report that you took in your cases and served, so the original document, the original statement. Sorry, I'm getting confused. All right. Um, apologies. Ms. Wills, you understand that in, in the cases that you were involved with, yes. there was a generic statement that you served in Ms. Sefton and Ms. Neal's cases. Yes. And Mr. Allen's case. Yes. And that started out life as a generic statement, correct? Right, OK. Did you understand that? I'm not sure that I did. So where did you think this statement had come from? I assumed he'd prepared it. Well, let's go a little further into the emails and see if we can make sense of this. Can we please go to POL 000? Nine seven one three seven. Page two, please. You were taken to this before, Mr. Boltz, yes? Yes. So this is Miss Panter telling Mr. Jenkins, so we can see this from the first paragraph. She suggested to him that his, that his statement, so the expert report, <coughs> yes? Has been served as evidence in a number of post office cases. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, we saw not very long before that, Mr. Jenkins was saying he didn't know that his report was for any specific case, correct? Yes. So can you help us with whether or not what she was suggesting there was actually true? I'm sorry, I'm still a bit confused. <laughs> Miss Panter, your colleague, was suggesting that Mr. Jenkins' report had been served in other cases. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, um, Ms. Dobbin, but is that actually right? As I read it, she's saying it's been served in the Nemesh Patel case, and she's seeking his permission for it to be served in cases one to six. I may have misread it, but at the moment, that's what I think it means. Well, sir, that's really what I'm trying to get Mr. Bolter's help with, because right. the first paragraph says, as you may be aware, your expert report has been served as evidence in a number of post office cases. Yeah. I, I follow, but it just seemed to me that the substance of it, once she actually yes. out, um, says something different. But I agree, it, it, it's um, unclear, should we say. Yes. And that's really what I'm seeking your help with, Mr. Bolts, whether or not you know that, in fact, was correct that the statement had been served. Oh, I see. Um, in November? Yes. Um, it, well, it hadn't been served in either of the two cases that I was dealing with. I can't say if it had been served in any others. Yes, and if it hadn't been signed, for example, then it's very unlikely that it would have been served in other cases. Do you that's, agree? Yes, I do, yes. So, to the extent that she was giving the impression to Mr. Jenkins that his report had been served in other cases, it does look like that was wrong. Do you agree? I see what you're saying, yes. And then what she goes on to tell him is that it should be noted, and this is the second paragraph, that to date, most, if not all, cases raising the horizon system as an issue have been unable, not willing, to particularise what specific issues they may have had with the system and how that shapes the nature of their defence. As we already have your detailed report, I would like to serve it in each of the cases listed below. Yes? Yes. And then, as has been pointed out by the Chair, she goes on to say that the report had already been served in one case. 
correct? Yes. So saying, I'd like to serve your report in the remaining cases and have attached a case summary of each case so that you can familiarise yourself with the facts. Yes, that's what it says. So in other words, what she was saying here is, I intend to serve your report in cases where they haven't raised a specific issue with the Horizon system, correct? Um, well, that's made... Yes, I think that's what she's saying, but clearly some of the cases, specific issues had been risen, as in for Mr Allen. I'm, I'm going to go on to deal with that, Mr Bolts. What I'm okay. trying to set out is the background by which the statements came to be given. Yes. So you agree with me, there are no meaningful instructions in this email, are there? No. She's telling him, I want to serve your report in these cases, and I've attached a case summary. Correct? Correct. She's not asking him to comment on the detail of the individual cases, is she? She's not, no. And you wouldn't instruct an expert, would you, by just sending them a case summary, would you? Um, no, you wouldn't, no. If you were instructing an expert, you might set out what the issues were in each individual case, correct? You would, yes. You might provide all of the documentation that's relevant to the expert's opinion, correct? Yes. And just to be clear, this was the position in relation to two of the cases that you had conduct of, correct? Yes. Can we please go to the next document in the sequence? This is POL 000 Oh, sorry, page one, please. So I think you were taken earlier to the email that appears on the second part of this page. The bottom part. Yes. So Mr. Jenkins in reply is asking why the general statement that he made couldn't be sent, correct? Yes, he is. So the statement that doesn't refer to any specific cases at all, yes? Correct. And then what she goes on to say at the top, if you could just have a look at that. Now, first of all, Mr. Bills, before you answer, you'll notice that the um, addressee list has been redacted. I see. Apparently, it's email addresses. So this is a document which you may not have been sent, okay? Yes. But I want to look again at what Mr. Miss Panter is suggesting her approach was going to be. Yes. So one can see, I half expected to receive such a response. I can clarify with Gareth that it doesn't matter that specific cases are not quoted in his report, as not one of them has raised a specific issue with the Horizon system itself. They have all been generic to date. I will confirm with him I intend to use the same report, but I've had to run it past him first as a matter of course. Yes? That's what it says. So in other words, to be clear about this, Miss Panther's approach is None of these cases have raised a specific issue, so Mr Jenkins doesn't need to deal with any of the underlying yes. facts or information or relevant material, correct? Yes. correct. And if we could then go on to see what she tells Mr Jenkins, and this is FUJ 0015, Three eight five six. Page one, please. So this is the email that Mr. Jenkins has sent, setting out what the approach, what approach is going to be taken. 
So first of all, she apologises for approaching the cases in an unconventional way. Do you see that? I do. And then we see if we go down a couple of paragraphs. In response to your email, Gareth, I do intend to use the report that you have already provided. It doesn't matter that you have not mentioned a specific case in your report, as there has not been any specific criticisms raised by any of the defendants provided in my list of cases. It would be different if a specific criticism, criticism was made, as your report would have to respond to that particular issue. And perhaps if you just read on, I won't read it out, Mr. Bowles, but if you were just to read on down a bit in terms of what she says about the approach that's going to be taken. You want me to read to the end? Well, I don't. I think if you could just read to. That's why it's important for you to consider the case summaries. Yes. Mr. Bolts, having read that, do you think that there's anything troubling or problematic about the approach that Miss Panter was taking to these cases? Well, yes. Each case is individual and unique. Um, they should have all been dressed specifically, not in a generic way, as suggested in this approach. Um, may I run through a number of things that might be thought wrong with this approach? So first of all, do you agree, Mr. Bolts, there's the lack of formality. Again, this didn't constitute the instruction of Mr. Jenkins as an expert, did it? No, it didn't. She was telling him again, wasn't she, that it did not matter that his report did not address any of the facts of the cases. Do you agree? I do. She was proposing this approach, providing him with only the barest amount of information about each case. Do you agree? Yes. And then she appears to have the idea that it's proper for the prosecution by this route to put the onus on the defence, correct? Correct but then seem to envisage that if that happened, Mr. Jenkins might, ha might have to give evidence at the trial, yes? Might not have to give evidence, Might yes. have to give evidence might at have the to trial. Give <coughs> yes, so it's suggesting it's a possibility he would have to give evidence, yes. That's not an approach that makes very much sense. Do you agree? Uh, it, he should have been properly instructed um, by either Ms. Panter or Mr. Singh, yes, yes. In, in a formal way uh, as an expert witness with the, all the requirements therein. It was wrong to tell him that he didn't need to consider the facts of any individual case. Do you agree? That yeah, was the wrong approach. Yes. Precisely because, as you say, it's the responsibility of the prosecutor to consider each case on its facts and merits, correct? Yes. And by this approach, Miss Panter was essentially abrogating that responsibility, do you agree? Yes. It's almost as though post office wanted to have it both ways, that they want to present this evidence as an expert report, but absent any expert <coughs> instructions or any of the material that an expert would need to see in order to be able to provide a proper opinion, do you agree? Well, um, I, I agree that he should have been properly instructed and given all the information he needed, yes. Can you explain why he wasn't? I cannot. But it, it, it's part of a deliberate strategy, isn't it, Mr. Bolts? Uh, I couldn't say. It, it's a deliberate litigation strategy not to engage with any of the facts in a given case, correct? Um, 
I'm, I'm not sure uh, that I would uh, suggest that that's what she's uh, trying to achieve. Well, she's telling him in terms, isn't it, that it doesn't matter that he doesn't know anything about the facts of a given case? She is, yes. Well, can we just look then at how this develops? Can we go, please, to FUJ 00156677? So again... This is what follows, and if we just look at the documents that are sent, it's only the summary of the case and the indictment, correct? Yes. And again, if we look at what the instructions, such as they are, are, you can see it's, would you consider, um, sorry, would you consider the attached and provide a signed and dated report which deals with each individual case. And then some information by way of update. Yes, that's correct. So again, no instructions. Do you agree? No formal instructions, no. So no instructions to an expert. Sorry, by that I mean, Mr. Oh, Sorry, that those are, not, those are not the sort of instructions that would be given to an expert, are they? No. And again, on the basis of only the barest amount of information, correct? Correct. And not a proper instruction to consider the issues or the facts of a given case, correct? Um. Well, he had some information, but yes, not, not the complete well, package. Some yes. information. Yes. It's a case summary and an indictment. Yes. There's no attempt, is there, on the part of Miss Panter to set out in relation to any of these cases what the individual facts or circumstances or issues between the defence and the prosecution are? I think what I'm trying to say is it's not... I'm not sure that it's a deliberate strategy uh, by her. Um, it's probably out of inexperience that she's doing this rather than because she's trying to achieve something. And Mr. Bills, why is she doing that in respect of cases that you have conduct of? She'd been tasked uh, to coordinate getting the expert reports. And can we turn then to the instructions that you gave? And this is FUJ 0015. Three eight six five. You don't add any detail, do you, Mr. Bolts, to those instructions or substance? Yes, I don't know. Um, yes, I. I don't know what I mean by outlines, so but, but probably case summaries. So you've provided some more information, but you don't provide anything more by meaningful instruction, do you? Well, uh, some of my case summaries would have been quite detailed, but I'm, I can't say what papers it a case they summary. actually where it says Alan, Seth and Neil papers. I'm not sure exactly what that includes. A case summary is not instructions to an expert, is it? No, they're not. And again, this isn't, this isn't the sort of instruction one might expect to see to an expert in a given case, setting out the issues, setting out what you want their opinion on. Anything like that, is it? No, that's right. Uh, as I say, I wasn't aware of what previous instructions he'd been received or whether he'd been formally instructed before this email. Did Mr Blake put to you that Mr Jenkins hadn't received any meaningful instructions in the materials that you had been taken to and I, I think you said he hadn't been given any formal instructions but N Mr Blake was right wasn't he? Mr Jenkins wasn't provided with any meaningful instructions in these cases was he? 
Yes, although I, want, I wasn't aware, as I said, that he hadn't been formally instructed in the terms I've yes. described. But, Mr Bills, what, what you suggested in your evidence was that Mr Jenkins had been instructed in each case to amend his generic report in order to deal with the facts of the individual cases. Yes. Correct. But we haven't seen any instructions thus far that actually even ask him to deal with individual cases. Do you agree? Correct. Um, may I then please take you to FUJ 00124105. You were taken to this, Mr. Bull, so I don't want to retread ground that we've already <coughs> been over. But again, one can see from that that Mr. Jenkins was still of the understanding that all he was required to do was sign the standard version of his report, correct? Yes. And he's asking you in this witness, uh, sorry, in this email, isn't he? whether or not, in fact, now that he's looked at it, whether he ought to go further. Yes, correct? yes, yes, yes. So he's asking you for guidance about his role in this litigation. Do you agree? In his role or specific information? Well, he's asking you about the approach that he was supposed to take to these cases. He's saying to you, however, having read through some of the info you've given me, perhaps you want me to cover some other things. Yes, yes. He's pointing to the detail. Yes, and he's yes. saying to you, well, here's, here's other, here are things that could be explored in these cases, correct? Yes, yes. And I think we may have missed this, just for completeness at the very end, but it's there that we see he points out to you that he hadn't been provided with any of the ARQ data, correct? Sorry, what? So if we look at the very final paragraph in that email. Yes, so... Um, he's said audit data, uh, not ARQ data. Sorry, that may be our, our familiarity with it. Yes. But, but that's where he's flagging up, correct, that he hadn't looked at any audit data, yes? It is. Um, as I said, at that stage, I wasn't sure what he was referring to. Um, I wanted... Sorry, Mr. Bills, I didn't mean to speak over you. It's just I wasn't aware of what ARQ data was or that it existed. So I, I wanted to ask you about that, Mr. Bulls. Does that mean that you were prosecuting these cases without post office having even provided you with some basic information about how the Horizon system worked, Correct. the ARQ data that there's, was available? There's references to data in all different way, shapes and forms. and. Uh, but nowhere does it say ARQ data um, in the papers that I was All right, given or, de or dealt with, yeah, or an explanation of what that was. What I mean is, Mr. Bulls, that when your firm took over this, got this role, or I don't know, was it a, did you have a contract with post office to do this work? Or was it a more informal arrangement? Well, I, I, can't, I couldn't tell you because, right. yes. But at the point in time when you became solicitor in these private prosecutions, you hadn't been provided with any sort of briefing or material that explained to you about Horizon, how Cor Horizon worked or what ARQ data was available. Correct, yes. May I also just touch again on one small point, and it was the reference in this email to Mr Jenkins having no information about complaints and investigations. Yes? Yes. And I think in answer to questions by Mr Blake, you accepted that on the face of his witness statement, Mr Jenkins had set out or provided information about challenges in previous cases, correct? Yes. So you couldn't quite understand how, what that was, what he was referring to when he said, I, I don't have information about complaints and investigations. Yes. And am I right in thinking you didn't go back to him to try and understand what he meant by that? That's correct, yes. And you didn't try and resolve why that appeared different to what he was saying I did in not his know. statement? 
So even though it looked clear that there was a misunderstanding between you, you didn't think you ought to resolve that before his statement was served? No. And again, is there a reason, Mr. Bolts, why you wouldn't want to make sure there was common understanding between you before the witness statement was served? I, I can't. I can't recall. Um. I just want to, one last question, if I may, please. Um, Mr. Bolt, you ultimately decided in the cases of Miss Sefton and Miss Neal that you weren't going to obtain any of the data, correct? And you've explained that you didn't understand that there was ARQ data and what that was, yes? Well, in case of Mr. Allen, I'd asked, I'd referred it back to Paul to see if they wanted to get the further data. All right, I'm just dealing with Miss Sefton and Miss Neal. Yes, for the in, moment. in her case, yes. You decided, and you said that you thought there were two explanations, but I think they came to the same thing, that you didn't understand what the significance of that data might be. Absolutely, yes. But is another explanation that, in fact, the prosecution was proceeding on the basis that that data didn't matter because their case was being treated as false accounting and outside the horizon system? This was, do you recall that you were taken to your reply to the request for disclosure? And that's what I, the response I, was? In, initially, yes, but I think the case progressed after that and they, the defence made clear uh, that it was a horizon challenge. All right, so this was simply your misunderstanding of, at that time, I believe so, yes. of what that data might, yes. might demonstrate. Thank you, I'm grateful. Thank you very much, sir. I I'm told that Mr. Maloney has two minutes of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Maloney is one of the persons who um, tell me he's going to be two minutes, and I have reasonable faith that he means it. <laughs> I I I'll try to maintain that reputation, sir. Uh, just a few questions, Mr. Bolshe, if I may. Yes. You said in answer to the questions from Ms. Dobbin that the four questions asked of Mr. Jenkins by Mr. Bowyer should have been included in his report. You, you'll have to point me to them, sorry. I, can't. I, I, I wanted to save time. You remember the four questions essentially saying, please detail the attacks that have been made on um, the Horizon um, system in previous cases and so on, those four questions, and you said that those four questions, essentially the instructions to Mr. Jenkins, should have been included within his report. Do you remember that now? Yes, I do now. Yes. Right. <clears throat> because the instructions to an expert of that kind should be included within the report. They should, yes. And you obviously knew that an expert report should inc include the usual declaration, including the expert's duty was to the, to the court, primarily and uh, that the export expert was required to disclose anything they were aware of that might undermine the opinion they expressed. Yes. Yes. Now, you said to Miss Dobbin that you assumed that John L. Singh would have educated Mr. Jenkins in his role as an expert, as he'd used him in the Seema Misra case. Yes. Yeah. Now, you've spoken today of how you weren't particularly impressed with Mr. Singh, that you didn't know how he had the job that he had at the start of your evidence. Do you remember that? Yes. When Gareth Jenkins wrote statements that didn't include the usual declaration, did that not ring alarm bells for it, you as to the quality of education that might have been provided by Mr Singh? It should have done. Yeah. Did you not ask yourself, for example, where is the declaration? So when I received those reports, I was focusing on the content rather than the presentation and the, the, the proper requirements. Right. OK. And so when you signed off, the Mr. Jenkins report in Mr. Allen's case, in the correspondence with Mr. Bradshaw that we've seen, saying that it was sufficient for what you needed, you didn't think about the expert's declaration then? No. Thank you very much. That's all I ask. I take it that's it, Mr. Blake. That is, yes, sir. <coughs> <coughs> 
So thank you, Mr. Balls, for providing your witness statement and for giving evidence before me today. I'm grateful to you. Um, we're sitting on Monday uh, next week, are we not, Mr. Blake? We are, yes, with Mr. Atkinson. And I, I've said that um, we're starting at 10.30 on Monday. <clears throat> There's an outside chance, and it is only an outside chance, but it may be a few minutes later than that, because I have to be somewhere for a little while on Monday morning. But um, if there is a delay, it won't be very much of a delay, all right? Thank you very much, sir. So 10.30 uh, on Monday morning, or as soon thereafter as I appear. Thank you.